Hello, Paul and Roger. Hello, hey, Bob. Bob. Good to see you. Good to see you. Let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show on MeaningOfLife.tv. Why don't you each uh, just introduce yourselves? Paul, begin. Sure. I'm um, Paul Knitter, and uh, I uh, am a um, formally trained Roman Catholic systematic theologian. That means I've earned my, my living by trying to make sense of the Christian tradition, especially within the Roman Catholic Church. But for most of my career, um, if I would say all of it, since my studies way back uh, some 50 years ago at, in Rome during the Second Vatican Council, my interest has been in how to promote um, on the part of Christians a more positive attitude and engagement with other religions and how to, in general, uh, bring the religions of the world into a more cooperative relationship. This is sometimes and I'm, re I'm retired now about as of about three years, and I was formerly teaching at Union Theological Seminary and Xavier University. Okay, and you're still emeritus at Union. That's right. And, and that enterprise you refer to is sometimes called the interfaith movement. Is that right? Correct. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. So, Roger, what do you want to say about yourself? Well, I'm Roger Haid. I'm a Jesuit priest. I am a scholar in residence at Union Theological Seminary. I'm a, I have a background in systematic theology, which, uh, like Paul, uh, tries to make sense out of the basic doctrines that Christian, Christians prof profess. So I got my degree in theology at the University of Chicago and have taught at several Jesuit faculties of theology before I came to Union Theological Seminary in 2004. So I've been here at Union for 11 and a half years, and I consider it presently my home. Okay, thank you very much. Now, we are here today to discuss a book that you two have just jointly published called Jesus and Buddha, Friends in Conversation. The subtitle should not be taken to mean that this is a conversation between Jesus and Buddha. Sadly, they were not available. Uh, you are maybe in a sense standing in for them. I mean, let me, let me see if I get this right and you can correct me if I've, I've got it wrong. Uh, Paul, you, uh, as you said, your tradition is Christian, uh, but you've gotten very involved in Buddhism and it's become an important part of your spirituality, as I understand it. Uh, Roger, you, you, I think started the conversation with Paul, at least with, with a little, less Buddhism in you than Paul has. And so, to some extent, I gather this is a conversation between you. The book is a conversation between you to you know, try to share perspectives. Um, to do a little uh, kind of compare and contrast uh, between Buddhism and, uh, and Christianity and, and find things that they may have in common. And, and uh, also to, to, to talk about the very phenomenon of kind of interfaith dialogue and the phenomenon of dual religious belonging, have more, having more than one religious identity as, as, as you do, Paul. Uh, so before I ask you another question, did I get anything wrong there or is there anything that important that should be added? No, I no. think that, that pretty much uh, says it. Uh, I would add to it that uh, <clears throat> one of the reasons for this conversation is to learn. Uh, in other words, if uh, religions say, stay locked in their own systems, there's so much more that they could learn if they entered into dialogue. So it's not only a comparison, but it's also uh, built on a new supposition, I think, really, for Christianity, that there is something to be learned from the other religions, and to take them seriously will modify your own self-understanding. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I have found that what Roger just said, to be particularly tr true for myself, or personally, that um, it has been my, um, my own experience that um, uh, Buddhism has been um, quite essential for my, for my own spiritual or religious identity um, as a Christian. Um, so it's, in the book then, I, uh, although my, I grew up as a Christian, I have, um, over the past uh, 15 years, you know, also been a practicing Buddhist. And so in the book, I try, as you put it earlier, Bob, to uh, to try to speak for Buddha, you know, as much as anyone can, um, um, recognizing that uh, I'm a, 
a bit of a deluded Buddhist, Buddhist insofar as, um, as I have preserved also my, my, my Christian identity and my Christian uh, practices. Mm -hmm. And did you feel as you, so this is a literal conversation, I mean, fairly literal conversation that was had, I guess, I mean, how was the actual conversation had? Was it, was it, uh, an oral conversation that was that was recorded and touched up, or was the was the exchange actually in writing? Mm -hmm. um, well, the way the way we worked it out, the first phase of the book was in writing. Mm -hmm. That uh, we 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 determined a um, a list of 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 issues of questions dealing with the human condition, dealing with the the uh, understanding of ultimate reality, dealing with ethics. Um, and each of us then wrote, um, I think it was, Roger, help me to remember, 5,000? 2,000 words. 2,000 mm -hmm. word um, statement on what, what a Buddhist, how, how Buddha might respond to those questions. Mm -hmm. um, and, and Roger, how a Christian would, would, would respond. And then we each answered each other with 500 words. Right. Um, and at that point, when we finished that for all 12, was it 12 chapters, um, then we spent a couple of days together in, in, in New York. I flew in to, to New York from here in Madison, Wisconsin. And we just spent two full days. Was it two, Roger? I think well, so. Like that. oh, yeah, that's right. It was where we took it chapter by chapter and tried to work out where is it that we can agree? Where is it that we find ourselves disagreeing? So that each chapter ends up with a section, I think we titled it, It Seems to Us. Mm -hmm. So that, that did come out of very intense conversations. And was there a sense going in that you were trying to persuade each other of something? I mean, I guess maybe this is a question for Paul in particular, since you you had this uh, this affiliation kind of with or affinity for Buddhism. Uh, and I assume you'd like other people to have it. Uh, was this at all, uh, was there any attempted conversion going on here? Oh, well, I mean, a conversion only in, in so far as two friends who happen to be scholars and theologians, you know, try to convince each other of, <laughs> you know, the, 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 the veracity of their positions. But no, I mean, it's, it's, it's more than that. It was, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to my fellow Christians, and in this case, to my good friend Roger, um, as a Christian who has found it immensely enriching um, to carry on this dialogue with Buddhism, um, a, a dialogue which, however, really does bring in certain uh, refocusing, if a uh, reclarification, if not correction, if I can use that word, of certain Christian attitudes and beliefs. And I wanted to, um, you know, to, to see if uh, these con convictions of my own, where Buddhism has enriched me, would make sense to a friend and to a colleague who is one of the most, re most recognized um, uh, Roman Catholic theologians here in the United States. And Roger, did your perspective change significantly as a result of the interchange? Uh, it did. Let me uh, just back up and just fill in one little blank about the background of the book. Um, before we wrote to each with each other, we had a class together. Oh, yeah. And uh, we had an extensive semester-long conversation with 28 students and ourselves. So that, that was a very rich exchange. And we saw students who just walked into this from nowhere and the, what their questions were. We saw others who were more expert and so on. So we had a wide-ranging, freewheeling conversation, which was not identical with the contents of the books, book, but very um, enriching, enriching yeah. and gave us a facility to talk about these things and know where the pressure points were and so on. Relative to learning, uh, yes, I learned a lot of things because there's a tendency not only to be convinced of the meaningfulness of your own position, but when you're challenged by a different position and you take that challenge seriously, you have to um, see its logic. And when you see its logic, it starts to influence and expand your ideas. 
So rather than, uh, in put, to put it in terms of subtraction and addition, it's more in a question of addition than in subtraction, where your concepts are expanded. They're, they're seen much more uh, broadly because you want to accept dimensions of the topic that uh, you didn't consider before, but really have an impact on how you understand. For me, uh, non-duality is a good example of that, and that enriched my doctrine of creation immensely. So, so non- non-duality, let me just say, being the idea that the distinction between you and the rest of the world is illusory in some sense, is that what you mean? Well, that, again, non-duality is such a tensive category that you can't sort of state it neatly. It's it, a non-duality uh, doesn't doesn't mean that it's a monolith. It, it it means that there's unity and distinction, and that these are int- playing off each other all the time. Uh, but, but but we are talking about what is the kind of default perception in most people that there's a me, and then there's these other people and these other things out in the world. I mean that that is the baseline perception that gets in some sense, amended by the idea of non-duality. Is that right? Exactly, yeah. Yeah, I would say that, that, that that's true. You see yourself in your identity as being a part in a much more real sense of something that's bigger than you and unites you with all reality. Okay, now did you come to appreciate that in the sense of going, whoa, Buddhism has this thing, Christianity doesn't, it's great, or did you come to see it and see more of it in Christianity or in some Christian uh, traditions than you had appreciated or neither of those or what? Well, I, I, uh, in fact, uh, went back to the doctrine of creation and uh, to see how the creator is all of being in classical terms, uh, 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 Thomas Aquinas' terms of being pure being, so it's an all-inclusive uh, framework uh, so that a Thomas like Meister Eckhart would be, uh, often be accused of being a pantheist because he has this deep concept of, 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 of God embracing all reality. So suddenly you find yourself in a doctrine of creation fighting for your own individuality because God is all being itself and you add nothing to it. What can you add to infinity? So that, it seems to me, has contact points with non-duality that you find in Buddhist thinkings. It's not a symmetry, Mm -hmm. but they're they're running along parallel paths. So when you go back and forth, you're, you're, you're gaining something. Okay, well, well, this kind of leads to a question I was going to ask. Anyway, one of your chapters is called Ultimate Reality. And, of course, that's a, a term used, well, sometimes, uh, it's a term that's thought of as being able to bridge East and West by some people. In other words, it, it's, it's a, a, a Western liberal theologian's way of describing God. I mean, a certain kind of Western liberal theologian, right? Um, and then uh, it's it has a place in in an Eastern context as well. Is, is, is that right? And I mean, I mean, is the use of the term is is ultimate reality as the heading of a chapter? Is that itself an attempt to find a kind of common denominator? Because normally, I mean, people would think, well, wait, Christianity has this creator God often conceived of as outside the universe, in contrast to what Roger just said, but, but often thought of that way, uh, that way by people. And then Buddhism, it has, as practiced in Asia, it has supernatural, it has deities and things, but it doesn't have this, this big creator god, and they might think that that's uh, an unbridgeable gap. Is, is the idea of ultimate reality your way of, I mean, I guess this is a question for Paul, maybe, is this your way of bridging the gap? Well, that was, that was a question that came up frequently in our conversations, and um, if I re- if I remember it correctly, and just jump right in, Roger. I mean, I I always had a certain Roger. Roger, you had the the, the tendency, it, it it seemed to me, to to use the phrase ultimate reality much more. I don't know, much more easily um, or naturally uh, than 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 I. Um, and and part of my reservations was not just the um 
You know, the critical uh, 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 warning that I hear from contemporary uh, philosophers that everybody perceives reality from their own perspective and you end up imposing your own on others even when you don't realize you're doing so. And so I was worried about imposing the notion of ultimate reality, which Bob, as you just said, is, is more of a Western a Western notion or 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 symbol um, than it is in in the East. Um, but on the other hand, um, I think with these um, necessary uh, recognized cautions, we need some kind of a shared vocabulary mm -hmm. so we can talk about. I like what matters most for us. You know what what is most important. Of in, uh, so both in, in the way I want to live my life as well as in the way I understand reality. So both ethically or existentially as well as philosophically or metaphysically. Um, so we, 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 we use ultimate reality, but we also try to use, um, you know, other, other metaphors, other terms, um, that more, were more, um, more accessible to Buddhists or drawn from Buddhism. Um, something something like um uh, the emptiness or in in my tibetan buddhist tradition um what what we call spaciousness or um the nature of mind mm -hmm. um are terms that they use a Buddha, the tibetan buddhists use for um for getting at what is most important or what what i'm most interested in uh, what what matters most um for me. So, um, and I think that's what we tried to do. We, we threw out images, we threw out terms and to see if, um, if they can, um, function, um, in, in a way in which they will help us communicate. In fact, I think Roger, you, you coined, I don't know, you, you, you came up with the term. We're looking for functional analogies, um, points, analogies. So comparisons that can f help, help, function, that they work um, in similar ways for both of us. Ultimate reality as an, an analogy for that which we're most concerned about and that which we feel we're part of when we're living our life fully. Okay, anything you want to add to that, Roger? Yeah, there are some of those categories that work better as bridge concepts than others. For example, I do have a tendency to use the term transcendent and the transcendent. Uh, and that does not resonate well with yeah. Buddhism yeah. because it does sort of point to a reality outside of reality and therefore set up a dualism and so on. So it's not as acceptable as, for example, a ground of being uh. or a groundless ground of being to complexify this sense of, of uh, a power that's holding things together but is not quite other than, but is other than, but not quite other than um, individual persons. So you see, as Paul said, that, that it's always tricky. There are no neat matches, but there are ways of tracks, bridges, functional analogies that go back and forth and provoke yeah, uh, uh, provoke. Mm -hmm. Dissonance and say, yes, but, yes, but. And that's where enrichment comes. Okay. Um, so what, I mean, did, did you kind of in the course of this find yourself looking at any given prominent part of the vocabulary from one of the two traditions or the other and, and saying, okay, what can we connect <laughs> that to? I mean, it sounds like you did a little of that, but, but if you did, I mean, did, did you, for example, Say, okay, nirvana. What in Christianity would correspond to nirvana? And mm -hmm. if you did, do you have an answer? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I'll, you're working from nirvana, and, and you'll have a better, a better uh, 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 handle on that, I think, than I. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, nirvana, as I understand it, and have gotten some kind of a more personal sense of it through through my Buddhist practice and listening to my Buddhist teachers. And I just want to remind, I'm especially um, speaking out of the Tibetan Buddhist uh, mm -hmm. uh, school. 
um, because there are different forms of Buddhism as there are of Christianity. Um, but nirvana is, is the word that Buddhists use, uh, many Buddhists use, you know, to express what it is that is going on when they experience or start to experience what is called enlightenment. So in other words, if I would translate that into like Christian language that I think is faithful to what the Buddhists are getting at, is, or that has the same function as um, what, what uh, the way Buddhists are using their language, is nirvana is the Buddhist word that can be possibly applied or has similarities, analogies, to what Christians experience when they come to realize, you know, through their practice, through the following of Jesus, when they come to realize that they are, as St. Paul puts it, one with Christ. When they start to experience the unity between themselves as finite human beings and that which is the ground of all being or the 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 what is the the energy of all being um so nirvana is when buddhists start to wake up to that and um it it resonates it it seems it 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 functions analogously for what christians start to feel when they they sense that they are not the individuals they thought they were but that rather they are now you know, this is the the, the the passage from St. Paul's letter to the Galatians that is used so often, comes up so often in Buddhist Christian conversations. When Christians start realizing, oh, I, I'm not alive. I'm not, it's not, it's not me who's living. It's Christ who's living in me or as me, as Paul puts it in the second chapter of, so, uh, to Galatians. So, it's so it's, a, I think that's where, where, where I think there's, there's similarities, Bob. So, and, and Roger, you, you agree that there are these similarities, I, t I take it, and and also, do I do I uh, do I understand you be saying that that there can be a Christian experience? I don't know whether you'd say of contact with the divine or the or the experience that you are the manifestation of the divine, um, but that somewhere in that range, there's a correspondence to Nirvana. Is Roger? Is that does that make sense to you? Yeah, I I would. Uh... I just had a thought which I've uh, lost, but I wanted to add to something that Paul mentioned, and I, I got it now. I think it's this, that um, after you've built these functional analogies and you put them on the page and so on, it begins to sound like you're merging these two conceptualities. And we must say this twice or three times in every chapter that these words and these experiences that are behind these words are coming from very different systems, and you just cannot put them together. You cannot merge them. So, um, yes, I mean, uh, I, I would accept what Paul said because it's coming from uh, uh, a, uh, a perspective of one who's an insider to the uh, Buddhist practices and so on. Uh, so... Uh, the, the the tendency, I think, is to try to translate uh, Paul's response was two experiences, two subjective experiences in two different systems of of religiosity yeah. or spirituality and so on. The tendency, I think, uh, for an outsider, certainly for myself, is to read nirvana and and so on in terms of an objective uh, state or as an objective condition and therefore make it make it uh, synonymous with eternal life or uh, of your reaching, meet, reaching your final destination in, in, in immortality or something like that. Uh, but I think that Paul's approach through the spiritual uh, subjectivity of uh, these two uh, experiences to, to try to make them uh, to see their functional analogies rather than to see them in objective terms. Okay, the um, you know I I think the term ultimate reality I think is particularly prominent in the context of what's sometimes called the the perennial philosophy, 
I, I think that Aldous Huxley in, in, uh, used that term. The, the idea, I gather, of, of the perennial philosophy is that at the root of these seemingly different great faith traditions are are really core insights that are really the same. Um, and this is controversial. Not everybody believes that actually all the faiths are just climbing the same mountain, and when they when they they have all kind of you might say I don't know refined their key concepts to to the ultimate level of abstraction. They're talking about the same thing. Um, not everyone believes that. I mean, you, you are obviously flirting with that question, and I'm I'm wondering how you both come out on it in in the end. Would you? Would you say that you are so-called uh, per- perennialists, and, and would you say that you're more more or less of one, closer or further from being one, than you were at the beginning of your collaboration? Right. Well, I would add to that, uh, Bob, again, by turning to the subject, uh, the human subject, and to spirituality, I think that I take as a dogmatic, if I can, can say that, a dogmatic premise is something like the unity of the human race and that as a species, we are a species that have a a common structure. Uh, We call it humanity. And there can be communication, however difficult it may be. A cultural anthropologist will say, practically speaking, impossible. But I would say, but not impossible. There can be cross-cultural communication. That's where you begin a dialogue, because if spirituality is the way basically humans live their lives, whether it be religious lives or purely secular lives, if it's a spirituality that's an intentional direction of one's life, then there are some questions embedded in that that can be shared. Not the answers, but the questions, so that there can be a kind of common asking of questions together. So the the quest you're a perennialist at the level of quest quest exactly yes I might I might go a little bit further um, certainly I have been um, <laughs> I I've been called to be uh, I've been accused of being a uh, I'm not just a perennialist but an imperialist perennialist mm, the worst kind <laughs> yeah right um, and 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 listen the 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 warning of the, or the criticism that is is expressed that you just su- summarized, uh, Bob, of perennialism um, is is valid. I mean, I mean, I don't. I mean, th- there's a danger to say that all the religions are really saying the same thing, um, because you you just you usually the person who's saying that, or very often, if the person who's saying that also has more money or more wealth, more power, then that particular understanding is going to be imposed on the others. But while the while there's a danger in the, imperi- the perennialist saying that we're all the same, I see a real danger in the more postmodern perspective of saying we're all radically different. Um, and where I am more of a perennialist, and I'll confess this up front, and, uh, is, is that if someone say, are religions more different than they are alike? That would be the postmodern perspective. Or are they more similar than they are different would be leaning in the perennialist direction i would take the perennialist direction i believe that that there is that which connects us there is that which grounds us um and that and that constitutes some kind of of actual or potential unity to the human species if that's, you know, and I, you know, you'd give philosophical arguments for that. But for me, the bottom line reason why I prefer that is, is simply, if that's not the case, we're lost. Because we are so different that we can't connect with each other. We can't argue with each other. Um, and in the end, our differences are going to be have, are going to have to be solved by, you know, by strength by power, by violence, rather than by communication. So is part of your enterprise about the kind of moment in political history that we're at? I I mean, you know, the world has become a smaller and smaller place as technology has advanced. So do you see this as, as, uh, you know, some sort of uh, 
intellectual reconciliation of the religions um, as a as politically imperative? I mean, if, if we're to have kind of peace on earth or. Mm hmm. Um, I, I don't know, Roger, if you wanted to. Yeah, I, I would just say uh, that that's almost a given. Uh, Hans King has this fa famous quotation. It's echoed in a lot of literature that you there has to be peace among the religions before there can be peace in the world. Um, which is not to reduce everything to religious, but it's an enforcement category. It gives it a, gives ordinary conflicts a kind of ultimacy that becomes intransigence, I think, frequently enough. And we're seeing that even in these days. Um, so yes, I, I think today's world has opened us up to a sense of pluralism, where pluralism means there's an overall unity, but within that common unity, there's really very strong differences. So pluralism is not just plurality, but unity. And so there's a sense of that within Christianity today that makes this question of the other religions really the major theological question of our day, because we have such a long history of the absoluteness of Jesus Christ and a mission project that was to encompass the world and convert all people to Christ. I mean, we are in a new place right now, and this is responding to that. Uh, and and okay. just to, dis to, to, to put a little bit more of a description to that new place that you mentioned, Roger, I, I, um, I, I do b believe, and, I, and I've, I saw this at the end of um, Robert Bella's a book, the last book that he wrote uh, before he, he moved on. Um, <laughs> now, Bob, can you help me with the title? It's similar to, it, you, to the title of your book. Is it The Evolution it, of Religion? or what? Yes, you, you, have, you have the uh, God. What is the title of your mine book? Mine is The Evolution of God. His, I, there, it, personally, I think I win, but you, cho you choose your more appealing <laughs> title. But, but, well, well, Bella's book, uh, its title is Re uh, Religion and Evolution. It's, it's some one of the, yeah, something like that. But yeah. at the end of it, he said he, he he comes to the to the kind of tentative and yet clear conclusion you know that that the religions are at a kind of new axial age you know mm -hmm. um, having gone through a real shift in religious consciousness and development back way back you know in be, between um 3000 up you know before before the turn of the of, of from BC to AD, as in the old terminology. Yeah, the um, axial age is this idea that there were a lot of kind of important intellectual and in, certainly including spiritual developments. I think largely in the first millennium. Oh yeah, BCE, right, right. It up, it went, it, it went from I think around twelve hundred before yeah. the Common Era to two hundred. Yeah, uh, before the Common Era. Anyway, that right now the religions are kind of being challenged and called to a new shift, axial age, if you want to use that mm -hmm. term, in which. They can rec recognize the need to collaborate rather than to compete. In other words, in other words, that each religion, and some are more guilty, if you want to use that term, of this than others, has to give up its claim for supremacy. Mm -hmm. And that no religion is supreme. Now you, no religion has it all. You could do that without much in the way of intellectual reconciliation or perennialism, right? I mean, you could, in theory, just adopt an air of humility. I mean, some might say that an air of humility is, in some sense, an attention with religion, as it is sometimes understood. Yeah. But in any event, as a, in theory, you could tolerance on the part of everyone would kind of solve the problem, right? Without without trying to convert everyone to perennialism or anything like it. But, but, but Bob, that's where theology or doctrine or dogma or beliefs get in the way of humility and to mm -hmm. tolerance. Because so many of the religions, in different forms, but especially the Abrahamic religions, well, as, um, have this claim of chosenness or of finality, Christians claim that Jesus is the one and only Savior. Mm -hmm. Muslims claim that Muhammad is the seal of the prophet. Um, in other words, no more prophets 
after Mohammed. That's why the Baha'i religion has so much trouble in Iran right now. Um, and so, I mean, there's, there, there are doctrinal uh, claims um, by religions of having the full or the final, the definitive word. And that is, it's pretty hard to be humble when you feel that God has given you the final truth for all religious claims. Well, let me ask the question another way. It, it is, um, even if interfaith dialogue does not produce a conviction that at their core all the religions are saying the same thing, can it bring about a kind of humility that is itself productive? And is that part of the idea? Yeah, my sense is that one has to go into the religious dialogue with that conviction. Uh, maybe it's possible if you're a very good listener and open and so on. But that question of being open uh, is very, very tricky because everybody has a stake in their religion. And the stake is kind of high. Mm -hmm. And to, to gain an understanding where you can really be supported about the, with the truth of your claim and at the same time be open to another who seems to be saying the opposite is a pretty high level of consciousness. And it's not one that translated easily translates easy into a mass consciousness. So that so it's tricky. Uh, theology, it seems to me, presently is frequently theologians among talking among themselves. And I think theology has to start communicating at large to its constituency so that even on the congregational level, the preaching can be much more uh, open and uh, can nurture a sense of security in one's faith, but at the same time, not sort of make that security a competitive truth, but one that's open. It, that's tricky business. And religion yeah. is touchy stuff. It's but I think we're stuff. I think we're ready for that. Just if I may throw in a very personal and and particular, just this past Sunday, at the at the church that I go to. Um, the 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 preacher the, the the priest gave a sermon on Jesus, in which the main theme was yes Jesus has a universal meaning for us and for all people. It was the feast of the Epiphany, the three kings. But he says, but Jesus has this universal meaning, but not an absolute meaning. In other words, Jesus is universal, so not just for Christians, but not absolute. And the people who so came what, up can you to elaborate him, a little on what what that means? What is no, the distinction? I mean, someone could take universal to mean ultimately all peoples will see that Jesus is the one. I don't think that's what you mean. I mean, maybe that's what's more meant by absolute. Yeah, yeah, right. I mean, universal would mean that what people, the truth, the, the the values, the vision that people have discovered in and through Jesus. Or, if you want to put it in theological language, that has that God has revealed through Jesus um, is significant for all people. Mm -hmm. It can it can enrich their lives. It can transform their lives, um, enrich, transform. But it is not the fullness or the final or the definitive expression of the truth that Christians believe is grounded in God. In other words. To say that Jesus is universal but not absolute recognizes that there are others, mm -hmm. Muhammad, Buddha, Lao Tzu, who are universal but not absolute. Mm -hmm. So, and and I see the response of the of the church, you know, was just I mean appreciative. The number of people mm -hmm. who went up to that preacher and 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 told him how important it was for them to hear it. I, I so I think. Of course, I'm, I'm guessing that if it's a church you went to, it's a pretty uh, theologically, <laughs> yes, okay. theologically and politically liberal congregation. All right, with, all so, right, yeah. so he was kind of preaching to the choir, as they say. Yeah, but I don't know if it was the choir. Yeah, yeah. The choir so is expanding, he's hoping. The choir, we hope the choir is but, but see, this leads to uh, something. <laughs> I mean, I, I think this is not just and maybe not mainly an intellectual um, 
project in the sense that in my experience, in a way, this is a, a big part of the thesis of the evolution of God to the extent that that book was a comment on what kinds of circumstances are conducive to harmony among religions. Um, in my experience, you know, if people are in, are making contact in a context that just in a social and material sense is conducive to harmony, like let's say they're on the same athletic team, and they're, so they're striving for the same goal, or let's say they're two business people doing a deal that's good for both of them. That kind of interaction is what puts people in a frame of mind to accept the other person's religious uh, beliefs. I, I don't think there are many fundamentalists in business class, you know, <laughs> you know, so to speak. I mean, because these people just have an interest in getting along with uh, with with their their colleagues in, in different cultures. They're making money out of it and so on. And um, so I guess to what extent, you know, I, I think to a large extent, this is a kind of a social and political project as as much as an intellectual one, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I agree with that. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, religion does, spirituality and religion do have their homes in the uh, gut, not just in the mind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I have found that the, the best or, the, or the, the more effective way of changing the minds of, let's, I'm talking about my fellow Christians, of changing their minds about other religions, of getting beyond what so many of us Christians were taught. I mean, uh, if they're as old as I am, um, you know, about, you know, the other, the other people, are, if they're not going to go to hell, they're, they're going to have a hard time going to heaven if they don't know Jesus. I mean, the best way to get people beyond those attitudes is not a theological sermon or a theological course, but it is in some way to to provide situations where they can make friends mm -hmm. with persons of other religions. Now, that's happening naturally, as you just said, Bob, you know, through the business world. And well, we our, hope. I mean, but, but But this is narrow-minded call them evangelical fundamentalists, mm. you know, who, 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 you know, don't want to have anything, see no value in any other way than, than Jesus. Once they start to become friends or once their children start marrying, you know, marries a Muslim or marries a, right. a, 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 a Jew, suddenly things start, can, can change. But to be clear, I'm not saying that, that it's kind of naturally happening, that we're naturally moving in the positive Direction certainly in short term because I think globalization also makes groups of people feel insecure, oh. culturally insecure, as if they're under yeah. threat. Uh, I will not get into uh, U.S. foreign policy and mm -hmm. <laughs> the effect that has had on 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 the yeah. perception of threat. But um, the uh, so I, I don't think it's a done deal by any means. It's, it's a real oh, yeah. challenge. But I'm curious if, if from you, I, I guess you're kind of involved. You're in this milieu, the interfaith milieu. Are things? Yeah, it sounds like you see progress on balance. Well, let me respond to you how that hits me, that question, as a theologian. Um, in a way, uh, this experience of the plurality of religions because of our smaller world and the communications networks that we have, because people have friends who are in other religions and so on, and see that they're authentic people and they have a very high morality and spirituality, this calls into question a lot of the doctrines that they were taught that, uh, taught, that Paul referenced. Then you have the problem of the meaningfulness of those doctrines. In other words, there's a tendency to say the whole thing was bunk. So in a way, as a theologian, my task is to, in this deconstruction that's going on, is to reconstruct a meaningfulness of a commitment to a Palestinian Jew uh, who has these, these, these followers and so on, to reconstruct it as a meaningful... Uh, so it's to give the doctrines uh, a, a new meaning, a new relevance, in a time where they seem to be slipping away for a lot of people. So that's, that's, that's how I see uh, it's a reconstructive uh, project that I'm in. And, and it seems to me you cannot have a reconstructive project without an openness to other religions. just can't. You can't have a Christology that's an exclusive Christology. It, it, 
it's it's implausible. And you want to tell some of our lay viewers or secular views, viewers what you mean by Christology? Uh, just an understanding of Jesus Christ, a uh, thorough, comprehensive sort of understanding of the faith commitment of a of a of a of a Christian. So it's a logos, a rationalization of one's faith in Jesus. Okay, Ken, mm-hmm. you go ahead. Uh, Bob, I uh, just this this shifting our 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 conversation topic a little bit back to the actual Buddhist Christian dialogue, sure. um, and as our time runs out, I would be um, I would be interested in asking a question that I don't think um, Roger, I had the chance or you have had the chance to actually um, ask uh, um, each other, but I'd like to hear Roger. Where were in our conversation? Um, where were were there any um, Buddhist perspectives or Buddhist beliefs where you, as a Christian, said, or at least any any claims that I was making as a Buddhist Christian, where you said, "Ah, uh, I can't go that far." Um, well, here's a real difference. Maybe here's where a real difference um, exists between Christian and Buddhist uh, teachings. Uh, um, what were, were there any such? Yes, yeah, so there's yeah. very clear, clear, clear uh, points that come up a couple of times in the book, and yeah. they revolve around eschatology. Yeah, uh, to explain eschatology, where we're going to end up as persons, and I do hold to uh, the uh, eternal life. And that's what the symbol of Jesus' resurrection stands for. It's it's uh, that the human person, in whatever form, will survive, however one explains that. And it's not easily explained. Uh, but I hold out for that. And that does not seem to be part of the Buddhist message. The human person is a phenomenon while that person is alive. But the human spirit of the individual gets diffused. And you does, mean in the process of reincarnation, you mean? Well, I, I, I don't know much about reincarnation, so Paul would have to talk to that. But the, the, the individual person is not uh, as continuous and as uh, having a self. Right, that, to begin with, yes. Uh, that uh, in Christianity it does. Yeah, and, and this is where reincarnation... Um, as, 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 as you know, Bob and, and Roger, I mean, it, that, is the, that is an extended process of its many lifetimes that one has in order ultimately to reach the, the, the fullness of nirvana mm-hmm. or in certain forms of Buddhism, you know, the, the pure land, which takes you then. But, but what is our ultimate... Um, what, what is our ultimate, I mean, ultimate, but again, it's, it's so difficult to talk about ultimate in the sense of final end, but that our fullest in for Buddhism, our true being, our true um, identity, and our deepest happiness consists in moving beyond our individuality, mm-hmm. you know, and in, in, in to realize that we are, in the Buddhist terminology, anatta, we are not selves. Um, and so in my, in my conversation with Buddhism and in my conversation with, with Roger, this was a point where we had differences that, that I think the, what, what, what comes after death or after the process of reincarnations um, is an existence in which there is life, but there is not a consciousness of my individuality. Mm-hmm. It's what, what in, in Christian theology is sometimes called, it, I, I don't want to burden you with jargon, but objective immortality rather than subjective. We, 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 we live on in the life of God. Mm-hmm. Um, and, 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 and the process goes on, and it goes on differently because of the way we lived, certainly. But it's not going to be a, a preservation of individual Identity. In other words, Paul is not going to be Paul Nitter is not going to live on for eternity, um, right. but there will be life, and the life will be different because of who I am. And there was there was a difference, I believe, that was yeah. in. Oh yeah, it's quite striking. Yeah. And and as Paul said, according to Buddhist doctrine, there's a sense in which Paul doesn't exist in the first place. Yeah, at, at, at an ultimate 
at an ultimate level. And of course, this is this is given uh, Buddhist philosophers a little bit of a challenge in explaining what reincarnation even is. Then that oh, really yeah. is a, that really is is a challenge. Um, but um, okay, so uh, I I assume um, I mean I think when when if you ask the average reasonably conversant person, you know what what kind of reconciliation there might be between Buddhism and Christianity. In Christianity, they would think about the so-called mystical traditions in Christianity, and I have a question about that because my very limited understanding of kind of the you might say classic mystics going back uh, a millennium or two um, uh, is that actually they had they report pretty diverse experiences. I, I mean, I, I think the people called mystics, unless I'm wrong. The, it, it, a common denominator is certainly powerful experience, powerful personal religious experience. Beyond that, it seems not nearly as consistently formulated as, say, Buddhist enlightenment is, even given the differences among different Buddhist traditions and, and Buddhist schools. And I'm, so I'm curious about about that, whether, you know, whether you can point to a lineage of Christian mysticism that, uh, that, yeah, feels, feels or seems pretty Buddhist. And if so, how far back that goes? Because, of course, modern Christian mystics like Thomas Merton were, they knew about Buddhism and um, the older mystics didn't. Mm -hmm. um, Paul. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'll, I'll, um, a venture, a venture, my perspective on 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 the mystics, but it is, I mean, you're right, Bob. There are you know different, I mean, there are differences among Christian mystics, but but when you um, when you look at the the writings of uh, and not just the medieval mystics, um, and not just Julian uh, Norwich and Meister Eckhart. Um, but even going back to to the to Dionysius, um, um, the the um, the experience of those mystics was so unitive, so 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 transcending of their own individuality, um, that they it seems to me I mean that they struggled with um, maintaining explaining the difference between themselves and God. Um, it, it, it was terms, in, and they use mm -hmm. terms sometimes in, in which, you know, they, they seem to deny differences and are this, this kind of the, the temporary manifestation mm -hmm. of, of a God that is they call love or that they call spirit that pervades all. That is, it seems to me, extraordinarily resonant with um, the language that some Buddhists use in terms of, of all of our particular forms being an expression of the ultimate emptiness. Mm -hmm. um, so, so there is a reasonably prominent strand of Christian mysticism, you would say, that does correspond to something like what we've been calling non-dualism. Although I, I should add, just so I don't have to answer any letters about this, a lot of Buddhists would say non-dualism is really uh, the province of a certain part of Hinduism, and and, and many Buddhist traditions don't l like that term because they think it refers to the the Advait. yeah the merger of the of the self with the ultimate. Whereas according to Buddhist doctrine, as you said, the self doesn't exist to begin with. Although common to both of these is. A, a, a some dissolution of the bounds that we normally associate with the self. That that's common. I, I think yes. that's kind of common to both the Buddhist and Hindu experiences. And you're saying that that is part of the classic, or at least a a, a prominent strand of Christian mysticism. Yeah, and, but also with the Buddhist Bob, um, you know, they you know ultimately we are not individual selves, but in this life they talk about you know the. You know the the ultimate um, uh, order and the and the conventional order. You know, are no the way of ultimate right. knowing and conventional knowing, um, and so the the level of emptiness, which is um, sh and the, the the ultimate and form, which which is the the conventional on the conventional level, but they say both levels are real. Mm -hmm. Both levels are real. 
Um, so again, it is it is a unity with without without removing um, d- d- differences, and yet it's an overcoming of differences in a much more profound way than most most Westerners, whether they're atheists or whether they're the- believers, you know, are 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 aware of or acquainted with, um, because the Buddhists say, you know. All of our form, you know, their, their term is em- emptiness and form. And they say forms are empty. Mm-hmm. Forms are, in other words, Christian, our, we, we creatures uh, are God. But then they'll say, and yet emptiness is form. Mm-hmm. So it goes both ways. You can't have forms, finite reality without ultimate reality, but neither can you have ultimate reality, emptiness, without form. Mm-hmm. So there is this one non-dual, as, as a teacher of mine always put it, Ramon Panikar, um, non-dual means not two, mm-hmm. but neither does it mean one. Okay. You know? And so it's this, this two-ness and oneness that, that live off of each other. Okay. Uh, Roger, anything you want to either add to that or say about Christian mysticism generally? Just anecdotally, I remember being at a uh, conference uh, talking about Meister Eckhart with a Christian who knew what he was talking about and a couple of Buddhists, and they knew exactly what the other was talking about. There was a bond between them that allowed them to talk and to appreciate what the other was saying, even though neither strayed from their own sort of boundaries as Christian and Buddhist. It was quite remarkable. I was very impressed by the event. Okay. And this is why Thomas Merton was so able yeah. to, to, to communicate with, with, with Buddhists and Hindus. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, well, that's a good note to end on, I would say. Uh, mm-hmm. Note of harmony. Um, yes. uh, not that this uh, conversation has been, you know, uh, rent by divisiveness in general, but um, but but that's a good place to end. We're run, we're out of time anyway. We could certainly keep talking longer. Yeah. Um, the name of the book is Jesus and Buddha: Friends in Conversation, and you are the two friends, and you seem to have remained friends. Mm-hmm. And that's great. So so thank thanks so much. And the book is uh, just out, right? It's just been out for a couple of months or something, or it's, yeah, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, great. Mm-hmm. Okay, very good. Well, thanks so much to both of you. Thank thank you, Bob. It was a really great conversation. Thank you so much. I enjoyed it, too. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Bye.